you have your glass of Florida orange juice this morning? For all who knew President Kennedy, this moment is a culmination, a happy rendezvous with history that makes his memory come alive. In dedicating this library, we honor Jack, and in honoring Jack, we honor the best in our country and ourselves. He loved this city with a patriot's love. He loved the sea with a sailor's love. And so he would have loved this site and the library his family and friends and country have built to celebrate his life. I can see him now standing by the shoreline, feeling the salt breeze, drinking in the beauty of this harbor, recalling its rich history and the great events that took place here when America was born. He would look out across the ocean to the horizon and beyond, peering through the mists of time. He would see his immigrant heritage, the green and rocky shores of the land of his ancestors, the Ireland whence he came. This is the White House, the home and the office of the President of the United States. Last November, some 70 million American citizens cast secret ballots to determine who would fill this chair, to determine upon whom would fall the responsibilities of this office. The choice was John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the youngest man ever elected. From their home in nearby Georgetown, on this day, January 20th, 1961, Mr. Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, come to the White House where they are greeted by President Eisenhower. Vice President Nixon, Vice President-elect Johnson and their wives were also guests at the White House. For many weeks, the outgoing and incoming administrations have worked together to ensure the orderly transfer of government. Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Kennedy now ride to the Capitol for the inaugural ceremony, the completion of this transition. Undaunted by the unusually cold weather, the crowds began to gather early in the morning. And here, beneath the gleaming dome of the Capitol, honored guests are assembling in order to take their places on the portico. Former President Harry Truman and family. Poet Robert Frost and Marian Anderson, famed contralto, two of many guests representing the arts in America. President Dwight Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon the Vice President-elect, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And the last to take his place, the President-elect. President who's seasoned through and through, but not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know, and young enough to do, well, it's up to you. 
It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. Do you like a man who answers straight? A man who's always fair? We'll measure him against the others, and when you compare, you'll cast your vote for Kennedy, and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. I never thought at school at college that I would ever run for office myself. One politician was enough in the family, and uh, my brother Joe was obviously going to be that politician. My brother Joe was killed in Europe as a flyer in August 1944. And that ended our hopes for him. Fascination uh, began to grip me. And I realized how satisfactory a profession a political career could be. Senator John Kennedy of Massachusetts, Democrat, throws his hat in the presidential ring at a Washington press conference. I am today announcing my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. The presidency is the most powerful office in the free world. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source. When no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. I have resigned as a delegate from Missouri to the Democratic National Convention. I did this because I have no desire whatever to be a party to proceedings that are taking on the aspects of a prearranged affair. A convention which is controlled in advance by one group and its candidates leaves the delegates no opportunity for a democratic choice and reduces the convention to a mockery. I've always believed that the Democratic Party should stand for an open convention and should resist any bandwagon that thwarts or stifles the free and deliberate proce deliberative process of this great instrument of democracy. Don't mind that happening in the Republican convention, you understand. <laughs> the Democratic Party must never be allowed to become a party of privilege for a man of modest means, or no means at all, cannot rise to a service in the nation. The future usefulness of the party and the restoration of direction and leadership to the nation are of such paramount importance that I am impelled to disregard the pleadings of some of my friends to remain silent about the situation that has developed. They've urged me not to do anything to upset or offend anyone by speaking up now. Well, you'll find that's hard for me to do. <laughs> but I could not remain silent because I think it would be tragic if the convention were to allow any one clique to ride herd over it. To let this happen could very well frustrate the hopes and desires of the American people to return a Democrat to the White House. That my disappointment at the manner in which some of the backers of Senator Joseph F. Kennedy have acted involves in no way, in my own mind, the person or qualifications of the Senator himself. I think, to a great extent, Senator Kennedy is a victim of circumstances 
brought on by some of his overzealous backers, which is unfortunate and unfair to him. Senator Kennedy has demonstrated ability, capacity, and energy to play an important and continuing role in the party and in this government of ours. I've always liked him personally, and I still do. And because of this feeling, I want to say to him at this time, and I'm going to quote a statement that I'm making to Senator Kennedy. Senator, you are you certain that you are quite ready for the country, or the country is ready for you, in the role of president in January 1961? I have no doubt about the political heights to which you are destined to rise, but I am deeply concerned and troubled about the situation we are up against in the world now and in the immediate future. That is why I hope that someone with the greatest possible maturity and experience would be available at this time. Every Republican politician wants you to believe that Richard Nixon is, quote, experienced. They even want you to believe that he has actually been making decisions in the White House. But listen to the man who should know best the President of the United States. A reporter recently asked President Eisenhower this question about Mr. Nixon's experience. I just wondered if you could give us an example of a major idea of his that you had adopted in that role as the, as the decider and, uh, and final... Uh... If you give me a week, you might think of one. I don't remember. Because... <laughs> At the same press conference, President Eisenhower said, No one can make a decision except me. And as for any major ideas from Mr. Nixon. If you give me a week, I might think of one. I don't remember. President Eisenhower could not remember, but the voters will remember. For real leadership in the 60s, help elect Senator John F. Kennedy president. Last Saturday, one of our most dedicated and courageous presidents gave the nation his views on the forthcoming Democratic Convention. Inasmuch as Mr. Truman's remarks were directed at me, I am taking this opportunity to respond to his statement. First, Mr. Truman suggested that I step aside as a candidate in 1960. In response, let me say, I do not intend to step aside at anyone's request. I was I was the only candidate to risk my chances in all the primaries, the only one to visit every state. I have encountered and survived every kind of hazard and opposition, and I do not intend to withdraw my name now on the eve of the convention. Secondly, Mr. Truman asserted that the convention would be controlled or prearranged. In response, let me say, to the extent that I have anything to do with it, it will be an open convention. As every convention of our broadly based party is open. This is the heart of Senator Kennedy's strength. The heavily populated city areas, particularly the Polish Catholic 4th District in Milwaukee.
just been presented this hat, but I don't have the guts to wear it quite yet. I, I got to stay in Texas about three more days before I'll uh, put that on. In any case, I want to express uh, my thanks to all of you for being generous enough to turn out. This is a long and a hard campaign, but I think it comes at a most important part of the life of our country. The purpose of this campaign, of course, is for the American people to be given alternatives by both the Republican and the Democratic parties, and then make a choice which direction the country wants to go. I'll make it very clear and precise which way we want to go in the Democratic Party. We want to go forward in the same way that Wilson went forward in his time, and Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. We want a defense second to none. The Democrats every year since 1953 in the Congress have made an attempt to secure the appropriation of more funds to provide for the national defense. Unless the United States is second to none, then this country's survival is in danger, and so is the cause of freedom around the world. The kind of society we build, the kind of power we generate, the kind of enthusiasm that we incite, all this will tell whether in the long run darkness or light overtakes the world. I welcome the opportunity to be engaged in this struggle as the chief arm of freedom. It is a proud privilege that we hold as citizens of this country. I welcome the opportunity, if elected, to serve as President of the United States, and if unsuccessful, to continue to serve in the Senate at a time when the role of Americans should be one of pride and satisfaction, that history in their own choice has made it possible for them to be the defenders of freedom. It started in July when the Democratic Party nominated Senator John F. Kennedy for President of the United States and for Vice President, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. The party united behind its candidates. Richard M. Nixon was the choice of the Republican Party. He had served as Vice President of the United States since 1953. Now he was a candidate for the presidency. His vice presidential running mate, Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. Senator Kennedy's wife, Jacqueline, has to limit her campaign appearances because she is expecting a child. But still, she is seen by thousands. Give me your help. Give me your hands and your voice to move America forward. With these words, Senator Kennedy asks the people to support his candidacy and his program. In 14 weeks of campaigning, he attracts enormous crowds. Each of the two candidates travels more than 60,000 miles. They go to small towns and big cities. At railroad stations, airports, and public squares, they meet the people of America. With Vice President Nixon is his wife, Pat. 
He introduces her to the people, and then he speaks of his program. He speaks of the progress of these past eight years and the need for keeping experienced leaders at the helm of the nation. Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. And now for the first opening statement by Senator John F. Kennedy. Smith, Mr. Nixon. In the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. In the election of 1960 and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist half slave or half free, whether it will move in the direction of freedom, in the direction of the road that we are taking, or whether it will move in the direction of slavery. I think it will depend in great measure upon what we do here in the United States, on the kind of society that we build, on the kind of strength that we maintain. Now, the Republican platform will cost more, too. It will cost a minimum of $4 billion a year more, a maximum of four and nine-tenths billion dollars a year more than we're presently spending. Now, does this mean that his program is better than ours? Not at all. Because it isn't a question of how much the federal government spends, it isn't a question of which government does the most. It's a question of which administration does the right things. And in our case, I do believe that our programs will stimulate the creative energies of 180 million free Americans. Senator, the vice president in his campaign has said that you are naive and at times immature. He has raised the question of leadership. On this issue, why do you think people should vote for you rather than the vice president? Well, the Vice President and I came to the Congress together, 1946. We both served in the Labor Committee. I've been there now for 14 years, the same period of time that he has. So that our experience in uh, government is comparable. Secondly, I think the question is, uh, what are the programs that we advocate? What is the party record that we lead? I come out of the Democratic Party, which in this century has produced Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman and which supported and sustained these programs which I've discussed tonight. Mr. Nixon comes out of the Republican Party. He was nominated by it. And it is a fact that through most of these last 25 years, the Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged, development of the Tennessee Valley, development of our natural resources. I think Mr. Nixon is an effective leader of his party. I hope he would grant me the same. The question before us is, which point of view and which party do we want to lead the United States? If the country will have voted for the candidate for the presidency and for the proposals that he has made, I believe that you will find that the president, if it were a Republican, as it would be in my case, would be able to get his program through that Congress. Now, I also say that as far as Senator Kennedy's proposals are concerned, that, again, the question is not simply one of uh, a presidential veto stopping programs. You must always remember that a president can't stop anything unless he has the people behind him. And the reason President Eisenhower's vetoes have been sustained, the reason the Congress does not send up bills to him which they think will be vetoed, is because the people and the Congress, a majority of them, know the country is behind the president. Senator Kennedy? Well, now, let's look at these bills that the Vice President suggests were too extreme. One was a bill for $1.25 an hour for anyone who works in a store or a company that has a million dollars a year business. I don't think that's extreme at all. And yet nearly two-thirds to three-fourths of the Republicans in the House of Representatives voted against that proposal. Secondly was the Federal Aid to Education bill. It was a very, uh, because of the defeat of teacher salaries, it was not a bill that uh, met, in my opinion, the needs the fact of the matter is, it was a bill that was less than you recommended, Mr. Nixon, this morning in your proposal. It was not an extreme bill. Senator Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, vote in his native town, Boston, Massachusetts. Photographers and reporters are all around them, for this is the man who, in the next 24 hours, 
may become President of the United States and she First Lady of the Land. Now here, as we've pointed out, you'll be able to follow the total popular vote for President as well as the total electoral vote, both leading and concluded, or won. The editors at the NBC Victory Desk are following the returns closely, and when it is in their skilled judgment that a race has been decided beyond question, they will command a V be placed beside the winner's name on the board. As David has indicated, one V has gone up thus far tonight in the state of Connecticut. It has gone, in our best judgment, to Senator Kennedy. The Democrats uh, uh, started out this evening, Senator Kennedy saying, or uh, rather, uh, Senator Jackson saying that uh, they would win handily. He has not had occasion to change his predictions very much, except in the case of Ohio, in which the results surprised him somewhat. And in his last uh, statement down here, he explained that uh, that, had not gone, that state had not gone as he had expected it to. And now, uh, back to Walter Cronkite. This is Walter Cronkite in our CBS News election headquarters, where almost three-quarters of the nation's precincts have now been reported, 73% of the precincts uh, as a matter of actual figures. Kennedy, 26,317,000. Nixon, 25,113,000. Nixon's popular vote has increased to the point where he has almost uh, cut the Kennedy margin to uh, one million votes for the first time uh, since long before midnight. Night. The Kennedy proportion is still 52% of the electoral vote, however. In the, uh, of the popular vote, that is, on the electoral vote, it still stands at this very close figure of Kennedy 265, four votes short of the 269 he needs for election. Nixon has climbed to 169 with the addition of Wisconsin's 12 votes a short while ago. It's noteworthy that Kennedy has not added any electoral votes except for the three in Nevada in the last hour and a half, almost two hours, and is holding steady at that 265. There are critical states at hand, which we will give you a report on in just a moment. First, let's go to Hyannisport, Massachusetts, and Charles Von Fram. Walter, for sheer persistence, I've never seen anything like this hardy band of Democrats who are standing outside the Kennedy News headquarters here in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Many of them have been standing here for as long as 10 hours, hoping to get a glimpse of the uh, senator and in what they hope will be, of course, his arrival here to accept the presidency of the United States. And uh, they're still uh, very confident that Kennedy is going to make it in spite of the fact that his popular vote is not running very much uh, ahead of that of Vice President Nixon. For a report of what's going on at the Kennedy compound two miles up the road, let's switch now to CBS News correspondent Harry Reisner. A few minutes ago, the lighting director out here at Senator Kennedy's home, looking up at this backyard patio at those pumpkins, said he thought he saw a smile already carved on one of the pumpkins. But it isn't quite clear whether he sensed a new solid feeling of victory out here or is just getting hallucinations from lack of sleep. It's getting late here as it is everywhere. But of course, there's a kind of excitement to keep the Kennedy family alert and excited. There's no sign that they're sleepy. There's no sign that they would be going to bed or even thinking about it, even if Vice President Nixon had conceded. The rule that is governing Senator Kennedy and all his activities tonight is that he will not say anything until Vice President Nixon concedes. When he does, the victory statement will come. <laughs>
across the country. It will reach out to visitors and scholars, summoning young men and women to careers in public life. For those in other lands, it will be a beacon signaling the message of this nation, a lighthouse bearing witness to Jack's truth that America at its best can truly light the world. He and I had a special bond despite the 14 years between us. When I was born, he asked to be my godfather. He was the best man at our wedding. He taught me to ride a bicycle, throw a forward pass, and a sail against the wind. As president, Jack was a glory on the mountaintop. The new frontier of which he dreamed touched deep and responsive chords in the America character. He could make lightning strike on the things he cared about. He was an irresistible force that made immovable objects move. Every documentary about this man inevitably ends in Dallas. But for me, the culmination of this incredible American life took place a year before he was murdered, when he returned to Ireland, the ancestral home of the Kennedys. It's President Kennedy at the height of his power and prestige, but it's also quintessential Jack Kennedy, glorious, glamorous, articulate, and witty, but at a distance. We see all the qualities that have entranced Americans for almost a century. the office of President of the United States. And I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. 